Out. So how do you, but how do you evaluate that? How do you evaluate that person now compared to some, what you called were the true believers? So it really is interesting. I've, I've really gravitated later and later stage because I realized my marketing talent and what I was good at over the last decade is actually far better used for things that have a little maturity to them so where I can use my arbitrage of marketing capabilities. So I become less interested in the very early stage because the only thing I now value, if I'm going to make an angel investment, pure idea phase, I need to know that that person's, um, my 100% evaluation now is on the person, could care less about the idea, and I need to know if they sold blow pops in junior high. Like, I'm not kidding. Like, when, you say, when you say blow pops, it doesn't matter if they sold blow pops as long as they started some business. Zuck sold, like, like he like put music on CDs and sold them in class. Like, I, that salesmanship DNA, that grit, that, I can't breathe without selling thing is very needed because the other problem we have in the ecosystem and we deal with this is we also have a crazy reaction to failure. I've been at too many dinners where the dinner is, I went out of business and everybody sits around the table in a circle jerk of, oh, it's great that you learned. (laughs) And your view is it sucks that you learned? My view is like, fuck, I don't want to lose my money. And like, I definitely don't want to buy you dinner and make you feel good that you suck. <laughs> but, but, but right, I mean, we have, a, we have an unbelievably awesome culture that has a unique twist to it. Like, I don't know. Like, it feels very weird that I've worked very hard my whole fucking life, wrote a $250,000 check, the person was skiing, skiing, four months before his company went out of business, and then I'm supposed to go to a dinner and celebrate the learnings he had in three years? That's broken. That's the softness of our current culture. I genuinely believe that. And, and do, you, do you think that's your view because, does that relate back to your upbringing? Sure. I think it's a hell of a lot easier to feel the way I feel that because I walked to Kmart when I was seven and split toilet paper with my mom versus going to you know, fucking Horace Mann in Columbia. Yes. And, but Zuck didn't. Oh, by the way, I'm talking about me personally. I don't think my path is the only path. I think there's killers that went to Horace Mann in Columbia. But if you're asking me the question, yes, I think that my reaction to that. Killers, you mean homicidal killers? No. No, I mean the slang term for real executors. Here's what I know. The balance of this ecosystem, I don't know what the class wants to do, whether build their companies or go and invest. As it currently sits right now, it's never been tougher at the earliest stage because you have just so many pretenders and the truth is it's hard. It's hard to like figure them out. I can ask you about you know, putting you know, music on CDs but like that's only one little tiny data point. You're you really. Have, but, the num- but the number of pretenders you have is correlated with the rise in the dollars available to those pretenders. And the romance right. and branding of being an entrepreneur. Yes. The brand equity around being an entrepreneur today is stunning. It is stunning for me to, to in the world, like I can't believe how cool it is in real life to be an entrepreneur and that makes a lot of young individuals gravitate towards that. Is that, but, you, but you're suggesting overall that's worse than if those young individuals went to work for Goldman Sachs or McKinsey. I am, because I'll tell you what we are you not. Like the world is a, a better place even with the bad ideas. No, I do not and let me explain why. Okay. The biggest conversation that I'm fascinated by is the suicide rate at Wharton last year. So we have, in parallel, a narrative that anybody can do it. And everybody's entitled to win in entrepreneurship. And there's an underbelly in our world that I'm concerned about. And you know, we've talked about this in a different panel. This is a big thing. I mean, like, when you are, there are certain individuals who've been winning in the first 20 years of their life in a game that was fixed before they played it. And then they go into the market and the market punches them in the mouth and they don't know how to react. And so yes, I do think, for the cliche picture that I'm painting right now, there are certain individuals that I just genuinely believe would have had a better life being the number seven at Facebook instead of the number one of shit book. Um, (laughs) Or or, or making 230,000 a year on Wall Street or consulting land at 29 years old. Yes, I think there's a lot of people that will be better. Like I love entrepreneurship the most, but nothing works when it's forced or off balance, nothing. And Andy, your point is just like, do anything other than 
Goldman. Yeah, yeah, sort of, right? In other words, unless you're built for Goldman. Goldman. Yeah, but, but what does that mean, right? Well, Maybe I know one are, thing. Some people, not everybody's built to be an entrepreneur. No, that's right. That's insane. A, right, but it, but it works the same way too, right? The other, in other words, you, it used to be, right? You graduate school and, and then you'd go work for a bank or a law firm or you'd go into medicine. Those were a bunch of different paths. Right, paths, which right? all suck if right. for me. But but and they may. But people, some people still do that, right? Yes. The, what entrepreneurship is about being empowered to take control of your professional life. Okay. Right, at some level. Do you know how many people are not capable of that? That's, but, do you, do you know, that's, how, but that's you know how hard market, entrepreneurship that's the, is? That's the market though. That's called the market. Not everyone, it won't work for everyone. Not everyone who goes to work at McKinsey or Goldman Sachs is going to be successful. That's like literally telling a basketball player that you should become a hockey player. You know that, right? Like, like self-awareness is very important and course, something that should be always. debated. Right. And I think we're forcing too many people into the entrepreneurial track that have, do not have the stomach to be an entrepreneur. So, uh, when you say we're forcing, I'm meaning we are or Ed is or who is? All of us combine the okay. ecosystem, the pr- right. self-promotion within itself, the outside world that, that decided it was the cool thing to talk mm-hmm. about for a decade and, and these pendulums swing. Mm-hmm. But what I'm most worried about, and I refer to it because I believe that this room all understand it better than me, I'm dying to know why it can still stay up. Like there's so much money in the system, there's so much other stuff going on and government involvement and so many other variables that are playing out that are just above my pay grade that I'm fascinated by when they cripple because this much fakeness has an inevitable fate. So why are you raising I'm raising a fund because I'm going series B and series C where I think my marketing machine that I've spent, so my behavior, as you guys know, over the last five, six years, instead of where I had a lot of leverage to raise capital and do my thing, I took a major on paper step back and built a client service digital social agency that I've grown in the last five years from zero to 100 million in revenue, right? To give me leverage for when the shit hits the fan. And so what I want to do with the fund in the short term is deploy it against later stage things that need a marketing arbitrage to create victory. So you basically said, I'm going to make these wild investments and I'll do it in Series B because that's where the funnel pinch works for me. They feel a lot less wild for me coming from Angel, A, so there's a lot more data of an actual business, and B, I can look at it and say, okay, her business, she's got it all down. Her one opening or opportunity or soft spot is marketing arbitrage the way I do it, which I believe is best in class, that's a good bet for me because I could bring the smartest money to the table. And so it's not just that you've opened a barber shop to get paid to do haircuts in a downturn so that you don't lose all your venture capital investable dollars. It's that there's a symbiosis between the barber shop. Even further, the reason I am building VaynerMedia right now is long term, I think it plays out for me on private equity where I buy businesses at scale and run them through the machine as I call VaynerMedia and make that arbitrage. I took a step back seven years ago and said, you know what, now that I'm hanging out with all these fancy people, you characters and way fancier than you, Travis, Saka, those kind of dudes, I'm like, I don't look like these dudes and chicks. I'm not these people. Like, here's what I am. I'm a marketer and let me quadruple down at that skill build infrastructure around that and deploy it against this world I believe in. So that's what I've been focused on. And where does wine fit into this? So wine fits into it in a couple of different ways. I'll get very real and transparent with you guys. And you know that you have such a unique perspective on this. My dad and I are very different. You know, like as different as you can really get. You know, personality wise, viewing the world, our backgrounds. As I was building Wine Library and I was getting more attention and things of that nature, there was a real forming tension for the first time in our relationship because as you know, my dad did, gave me the greatest gift. I walked in as a 22 year old and he gave me free reign. I ran that business every decision, which is remarkable in hindsight, especially now that I'm 40 and he was 44 when he allowed me to do that. Um, but as, as the narrative changed, as the business changed, there was tension between our relationship on you know, him disappearing from the narrative within our industry mm-hmm. that, and at the same time I'd made these good bets and AJ, my brother, was graduating college. Just felt like the right time to like make a decision where I would hand it more day to day back to him and the management team I built, Brandon and those guys. So the real life answer is for anybody that's been in a family business, the family business dynamic created a scenario where because I had all these other amazing options, there was no reason to create friction with the, one of the two or three most important relationships in my life. That's the real answer. And 
because I haven't been involved day to day as much. I've never enjoyed wine more because I don't look at a label anymore and think profit margin, <laughs> you know, which has been fun actually. I- ironically, I'm probably enjoying wine more than ever. And, you know, in a different way, the way that you look at it, because you have such a passion for it, I don't want to buy Dujac or things of that nature, but I think I might make a run at some point in creating a three to eight hundred million dollar yellowtail like brand um, just because I think I can do it and because I want to buy the New York Jets. <laughs> I don't know, that's just. That's a, that's a good opportunity for us to see in the unlikely event that any of you have questions for these folks. I'm happy to feel them. You want to start? Yes, yeah, so with this sort of inflated. What's your name? Uh, Clifton. Clifton. Clifton Smith, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, man. Um, in, in this sort of inflated ecosystem that you painted of yes. uh, wannabe entrepreneurs, do you feel that it has at least provided more good innovation that once have existed otherwise? I don't know, is the real answer. My intuition is probably a little bit, yes. But I genuinely believe that great entrepreneurs making great things, like Travis was an entrepreneur before, Garrett was an entrepreneur, like, I don't know, I don't know. Not as much as some people may wanna think um, because I think those people would have saw it through. I I think we grossly underestimate hard wiring and talent. I think we grossly, grossly underestimate hard wiring and talent. I think those things would have broke through and would have happened anyway and were happening anyway. But probably, I mean, if you have more people playing the game that wouldn't have played the game and done something else, of course there's gonna be some. But I don't think as much upside and I'm not sure as much casualty for the players in a net-net offsetting game. My opinion, what do you think? I, th- I think, um, this is where you and I disagree a little bit. Yep. Um, although we agree on some potential that I think the karma in the world is increased by more people believing themselves to be entrepreneurs, whether they have the skills or be successful or not. I think the karma in the world is increased. You know? so, so I think overall. I also think, the, pl- I also think the internet itself has created the opportunity as much as right. anything else. The infrastructure costs to be in the game are so low, that's as much of a thing. I don't think anybody became more talented or capable or visionary Mm -hmm. because the internet came along. I think it just exposed the opportunity at a greater level. Here's what's interesting. At the same time, that also made it much more difficult for any individual to succeed because everyone can do it. I totally agree. I totally agree. Makes it infinitely more difficult for us to be investors too. For sure. I agree, but the cost of starting is so low. Zero. So low. You just say it. You're an entrepreneur. <laughs> Mazel tov. Zero. <laughs> so, so, what are the I'm so, I'm so used to doing Q&A, I'm like, uh, what? What are the, what are the ramifications? You're asking we, your own guy. We know, we know we're on your show. What are the ramifications of this fallout for all of the venture funds? Because there are some interesting structural ramifications <clears throat> to what you're saying, right? Because obviously, <clears throat> And I do agree that there's definitely more garbage in and there definitely, you know, it used to be that like it was nerdy, it was geeky, people would ignore you, they would want to go talk to the people who run hedge funds yep. and that's great. And that was actually a much more comfortable place to be for a whole bunch of reasons. But structurally, we're going to be screwed if we have a whole wave of venture funds investing in companies that never should have attracted investment capital. That's what's going to happen. Behind them, a whole bunch of LPs managing pension funds and endowments that lose their money by investing in these except that, except that, funds. Except that software, internet-based technology as an asset class is pretty small. So the damage, right, if, 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 if 50% of all venture investments, uh, investments in the venture funds this year went bust, it's, it's $15 billion. It's not that big. Right? It's just big for the right. human yeah. individuals. Yeah. That's real money. No, 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 but it's not big for like macroeconomics. Yeah. Right, there's no, there's no. We, yeah, the, that's, first, that's true. In the first bubble, we shifted the risk to the public, yep. that was more meaningful. Now we've contained the risk to institutional investors. When we raised our last fund this year, <coughs> uh, uh, earlier in the year, when we were out talking to our investors, we told them that we believe for the next 10 years, venture returns on average will be lower than they were the 10 years before, and they should expect the returns from our fund and all the funds they invest in to be somewhere between 20 and 50% lower. That's called sandbagging. Yes, <laughs> but, it's, but also believe it. Yeah. So, so you so look at the data, the data So are you right? also raising money for a Union Square Ventures short fund? <laughs> <laughs> no. But our last two investments have been in hedge funds, though. So. Go ahead. Um, so you talked a little bit about inflated entrepreneurship, but 
Um, you could argue there's also right now inflated investors, like or inflated, <laughs> like VC. You are uh, damn right, sister. <laughs> a million. That's what. Funds. That's that. They work hand in hand. Right. So the question is, who should then? You talked about like who should be an entrepreneur. Um, who should be an investor? You know, I don't get to judge who should. I'm just excited to see how it all plays out. Do you know what I mean? I mean, who should? Who should do anything in the world? The people, you know, what I love about this is there'll be plenty of winners during this era. There'll just be a lot more losers. <laughs>